Hello, everybody, and welcome to Planet FPL, the world where everything's revolving around Euro 2020. My name's Serge. My name is James. And England are through. After Yay! Last night. We uh, were through anyway, bitch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the excitement of yesterday. Now we just got to figure out whether it's France or Germany that are going to beat us, or maybe even Portugal that we will beat. But we shall see what happens in the last 16. Listen, five years ago, we sat going, oh, who are we going to play in the last 16? And then when Iceland scored a last minute winner against Austria, we went, oh my God, brilliant. We're avoiding Portugal. What a touch. Anyway, moving on. So we might get hungry and get <laughs> yeah. fucking done over, right? Let's see what happens. How is your wildcard team coming along? We only had two games yesterday. So I had uh, just John Stones yesterday. Obviously, Mason Mount didn't turn up for me. And Thomas Socek. But Socek will be benched for... Uh, but either Bednarek or Paul Torres or uh, Morata tonight, more than likely. So, you you've had captain return, haven't you? Yeah, a Depay a couple of days ago. So that was really yeah, 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 yeah. 20, What was he a twelve points. pointer? Yeah, so twenty four points nice. from Depay is, is very good. So I'm happy with that. I'm on sixty five at the moment with uh, four players to go. Is that including what you're going to take out? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. You'll actually possibly be a little bit ahead of me. I only had one player yesterday. Top dog, Ivan Perisic. What a fucking star, mate. Captain C on him, 20 I pointer. I don't, I, I don't think our Scottish fans will agree with you, James, but you know. No, they're they're too they're, they're still too busy chasing Luka Modric's shadow, mate. I think. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna obviously leave the captain C on Perisic with a 20 points. That pff, nice 20 points from one yesterday. So I, I'm in a really interesting situation where. I'm on 73 points. Um, I've got Moreno in my 11 still to play. I've got Simon to bring in. I've got Nabry, Goosens and Havertz all to bring in as well. So I've got five to go. I'm on 73. The problem is I've got four players to bring in and I've only got three blanks. So yep. one of them is Buscan, Ukrainian keeper, who was a three-pointer. The way I'd look at that and go, if I bring Simon in, What's the worst case scenario? Slovakia scored twice and I get a one point. Oh, okay, I'm two points down. It's more likely a six pointer and I'm three points up, isn't it? Belotti blanked, done threes, one pointer, which, I mean, I mean, imagine if he'd have stayed on, I'd be in an even more awkward position right now. I'm going to take Marlon out, is what I've decided to do. He's on five points, got the assist for Depay's goal the other day. I'm going to take him out. So I'm going to be removing actually 11 points from my team, which are going to put me down to 62 with five to go. But the way I'm looking at it is I removed the 11. I'm bringing four players on. One return is going to at least match the four players. But I, yeah. I, I, I think if I left Marlon in, which ideally is the right thing to do, I'm then not bringing Havertz or Nabry in. And it will be Sod's Law, whichever one I don't bring on, the other one will fucking go off, doesn't it? So yes. I think I look at it and go, I'll bring them both in. There's every chance one of them will go off. Yes. So, yeah, it's, it's been a really successful wild card for me. Vinaldum's 13 points for Marlon goal, Mahaley goal, uh, Toloi clean sheet, De Bruyne assist clean sheet. Uh, it's been decent. Can't argue mm. at all. Good. Let's talk about yesterday's couple of fixtures. Uh, England won, Czech Republic nil. Can we just, um, can we just talk about the first half? Yeah, I mean, it really was a game of two halves. But watching the first half, the, the overriding thing I think shared by a lot of people was the freedom and energy with the likes of Saka and Grealish to just play. But Saka, it's not international football at a major tournament. It's just football down the park with your mates, right? It just, it just, I just love that uh, fearlessness, effervescence, just everything about it. Um, it, it plays with just such uh, joy and Grealish. I mean, some of the first touches uh, were just out of this world. Um, and the driving running. The, it was the running from midfield at their defence that caused them so many problems. When we picked the ball up and drive, suddenly they, they didn't quite know what to do and we created chances. Having said that, we didn't put the game to bed, right? Three games, no goals conceded, but only two scored. We need to score more goals if we're going to go further in, in this tournament. No shit. We can't... We can't bank on one nils all the way through I thought it was a, a decent performance all things considered with the fact that it was a dead rubber um, and, and England played okay it was nice to see Saka and, and Grealish get minutes but 
yeah, there's still work to be done overall. I think is the is the takeaway because the Czech Republic, let's not let's not uh, forget, had some good chances. They created a few chances, especially in the first half as well. The one Suchek effort and one long distance effort, which was They're a fairly routine save for and... Pickford, considering he's got little arms and saved it with two hands. Yeah, I think that they're still getting the ball in the box and still had periods of possession. Very average. It's worth saying there's, there is a there is a, a combination of results today, which is very complicated to explain, so I won't bother. But there is a combination of results today that could mean that England could play the Czech Republic again in the quarterfinals, actually, okay. uh, un- unbelievably. I don't think that would be the case, because I think they'll probably get beat by whoever they play in the last 16, I should think. I think they're quite a limited team, actually. I think we look back on that in hindsight and go, they were a bit lucky to beat Scotland. As I said the other day, I think if the Croatia game had gone on till next next goal wins, Croatia would have beat them. And they showed, for me, zero interest to try and get an equalising goal in that second half. I mean, the XG between both teams in the second half yesterday was 0.07 from both teams. I mean, England didn't, England in fairness, did not have a shot in the second half. It was pitiful. It was like watching it, it was like watching the game in the pub. It, with the game on in the background, like just watching through it because there wasn't anything happening. And I, that was probably most people's experience last night. Um, let's talk some positives for a change because I, I, I think the se- the second half performance has still got people on the negative. You spoke about freedom. And I think Bukayo Saka brought um, this kind of energetic, raw enthusiasm where it didn't feel like he was he was stuck in some tactical structure where you've got to be in certain phases at certain yeah, times. Yeah. Like he went and floated yeah. off the right hand side and yeah. stuff. Um, Foden, for example, I think he's a very structured footballer. As much as he's got incredible ability, I think he knows. Okay, we pass backwards. We pass backwards. Saka's Saka is Saka's goal basically the first goal because he turns. 10 yards inside his own half with his back to goal and then spins away from someone and runs. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you're like, oh my God, we're running at the opposition and we're like four on four. And you think, well, how many times have we actually manipulated that situation in the three games? Both goals that England have scored have come from a runner. Phillips run off the ball against Croatia, Saka's driving run. And okay, at the end, he got a return pass. He overhit the cross. Grealish actually, his cross gets a little deflection on it, which kills the goalkeeper. And uh, I don't know about anybody else, but the way Sterling headed in the finish was just Shearer versus Scotland, Euro 96. And it made me think at that moment, oh my God, like that was, is this the start of our tournament? Yeah. No, not really. The first half performance <laughs> was was fine. I don't, it, there's no point getting carried away with, there's nothing to get carried away with. I think but- it's kind of repeat the message of what we'd said um, on Monday's podcast of don't get too carried away with how bad Scotland was. The job's done. The job was done again last night to win the group. And effectively, we now go into a new tournament. We've played this tournament, which is uh, eight rubbish teams get eliminated. Make sure you're not one of the rubbish teams. And the new tournament begins. It's very rare, really, in major international tournaments that you get a full one-week break between group stage and knockout tournaments. So essentially, it's almost like a new tournament starts next week. And that's what's going to be the most important thing next week. Because... Again, there's certain results in the way they manipulate tonight. For example, if Sweden beat Poland, that it means that England's side of the draw, I think, is going to be weak, would be harsh. But again, it's going to open up. It could literally open up that our quarterfinal opponents could be such as recording in a card. He's just opened a fucking yeah, yeah. sunroof. It's, it's, <laughs> it's right, it's put hot. me off. <laughs> I'm sitting in, in, in direct sunlight. So I, I, I muted while I opened the sunroof just to get some air in there. <laughs> You're saying it could open up to, to who? To have, well, it could open up exactly the same as 2018, where in the quarterfinal we could play Sweden or Switzerland, depending on the results today. That actually could yeah. be how it looks. And suddenly then you'd be looking at, Obviously, the last 16 game is going to be really tough. We know that. But then if you win it... But it's at Wembley. We know it's at Wembley now, right? Because we we won the group. So If we win it, we would would be favourites probably to get to the final. Like the draw would open up again, almost fortuitously, just like it did three years ago. And don't get me wrong, it's still going to mean probably needing to beat a Sweden and and a Holland 
to get to the final. But I mean, that's better than some of the other routes that they're going to be knocking about and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and again, remember the, the Sweden game would, if that's who it would be, if they win tonight, that's the one in Rome, the one away game. We go, okay, yeah, we'll have them on a neutral venue. That's okay. Um, so it was really positive to win the game, win the group, stay at Wembley, have this really tough game at home. The attendance at Wembley next Tuesday goes up to uh, 40,000. Okay, that would so, be a much livelier atmosphere. The atmosphere double, was okay yesterday, crowd. I thought. The atmosphere's fine. I mean, the problem is I've been in Wembley when there's only like 25,000 there and it's really hard to... You can make the noise and I think for all of us just hearing the crowd noise at the moment is really nice. But to try and get the, the atmosphere going, like say we yep. all saw the scenes in Denmark the other night, to get that kind of intense singing and stuff is really difficult in Wembley when it's mm. like half empty and you're you're all kind of spread out and stuff. And that will still be the case for the last 16, but 40,000 be a lot better. That's going to feel, for, for the people who are there, that's going to feel like a proper attendance. And 40,000 people is a proper attendance. It, it just will still unfortunately look half empty at Wembley. Yeah. I think we're in a position with England now where we can debate the team till the cows come home, but we can probably now know what nine of the 11 are going to be subject to system. And I think we're looking at it now and going, right, if we're playing a back four, that that played last night is what it's going to be. Pickford in goal, Walker, Stones. I thought Maguire did really well actually for first game back and played the best pass probably any England players played so far in the tournament, the pass for the, Got Harry Kane his chance. Nice yep. for Harry Kane to get a bit of service. Shouldn't be coming from the centre back, by the way. <laughs> um, and Luke Shaw, I think, would be left back. So if we play back four, I think that's what it is now. I think Southgate has concerns about Reese James at right back in a four. Now, obviously, if we switch to a back three, I think that that very easily becomes Reese James playing right wing back, for example. If we stay with Cole a four, Walker dropping into the three, probably. Yeah, I would think so. Yep. Rice and Phillips are staying in the team, aren't they? I think. I yeah, think I don't see any Phillips. I felt the game passed him by a little bit last night. I didn't feel like he played badly, but he obviously played in a, in a deeper role last night, and that's because Southgate doesn't particularly want Jack Grealish deep. It's understandable. He played more in the pockets. This was a bit more like a four-two-three-one with what I called yep. for something a little bit closer to Harry Kane. I think Kane enjoyed that, knowing that Grealish and Sterling, those two, and the link on the left-hand side was constantly close to him. I think we have to accept that Raheem Sterling's going to play. At the end of the day, yep. he scored the two big goals again in the tournament. He's he's not going to come out of the team now, is he? Southgate. Uh, he looks him. hungry as well. I like. I think he looks hungry and he wants it. He wants to prove himself. So I think Raheem Sterling staying in the team's it's not a problem for me. And Harry Kane stays in as well. So the choices are for the game next week if we play a back four, and I don't think that's a certainty, by the way. Uh, particularly if it's Germany, I think we might change to a back three. Then it's the choice on who plays on the right. We now kind of is it Saka or Foden? And or Sancho, but Sancho's got no minutes, so we've got nothing to we, gauge. We we listen. We can all shout for it as much as we want. It's not going to be Jaden Sancho, I don't think. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Unless unless Southgate has been trying to keep this under wraps as some sort of perverse wild card option. <laughs> once we hit this new knockouts, I mean, to only give him yeah. seven, even to give him seven minutes last night. But to be, I mean, to be fair, Saka was our best player. Yeah, so yeah. It wasn't uh, really an argument is, to say, oh, I'll take him off. Yeah, it's hard. It's going to be hard to drop Saka, I think, uh, based on what we saw yesterday. Well, I, I think there's, there's every every chance that he could stay in the team. Um, mm. And then it's the case of obviously plays in the 10 position. Now, because the game Finish is on Mount. Tuesday, it does mean that Mount can play, but we don't know yet how long Mount's got to self-isolate for. So we thought that he would have to self-isolate till next Monday. So if you've got to self-isolate till next Monday, what kind of training is he doing? Yeah, yeah. So it would, be a, it would be a big call to play him. What, I, I don't think it's even necessarily that. It could be that he plays Foden at 10, right? And keeps Saka okay. on the right. Yeah, makes sense. I, as much as we all love Phil Foden and no one's got a bad word to say about him, I, I, I feel that the way he plays, and it's more of a controlled kind of continental style rather than Saka's kind of raw directness go at people. Are you back? Nice for us to rejoin us. What happened to you there? Yeah, tell me about it. So I'm sitting in the car, you can see it's direct sunlight, and uh, the phone decided to completely overheat and shut everything down. So I want the AC on now. That's because you opened the fucking sunroof, isn't it? <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> With, was, was my point about Phil Foden that I was going to say really offensive? Uh, well, that he's too controlled? It's not a criticism of him, it's his style, right? I just think he, it's yeah. not... 
it's not like what Harry's used to. And when you consider the bias we have to the left-hand side, which we've spoken about loads of times, it means the distances are really big. And it, it actually makes it, I think, for Foden playing on the right-hand side, makes it really difficult for him to link with if it's Mount playing as the furthest forward midfielder. He ends up basically having to play in triangles with Calvin Phillips and, and Carl Walker, which means he ends yep. up going backwards a lot. Whereas Saka has got that kind of rawness, directness. directness. Uh, Foden's, Foden's got it, right? Like he can take people on. Foden's not slow or anything. He can dribble and run at people. But I think Saka just, has probably just, he's, he's coming like a wild card into the team and he's got that fearlessness. And major tournaments, some someone does tend to have this kind of moment where for someone where they kind of come from nowhere. He was one when the squad was announced, it was basically he's going to be in for his versatility, but I don't think he's going to play unless there's a crisis, basically. But there's no, there's no doubt in his chosen. ability. He's a great yeah, little player. Surprised that he was chosen ahead of uh, ahead of Sancho in that position, to be honest with you. I expected maybe he might play as a left, left back in certain scenarios, but credit, credit to him. He did well. And, um, he, he doesn't deserve to lose his place, in my opinion. Well, I'm not sure that he will. I'm not sure that he will. And the fact that he likes to float off that position, is, there's so many positives to him, actually, yeah. in a strange way. No one's sitting here and saying, oh, I think Saka's a better player than Foden or anything like that. But it might just be that it's the right fit at the moment for England. My major fear in the game next week, whomever we play, is the midfield area. Because what we've seen so far is our progressiveness on the ball has been too slow. Yeah. And I did, I did speak on Monday about it might be that we play against a better team and we're well set up to counter-attack properly. I'm a little bit concerned that they might get overrun in that area, which is why I think ideally Southgate will be desperate for Mount to come back. It could even be that rather than saying, oh, it's going to be Foden or Grealish at 10, it might be, for example, if it's France, he might decide to go Bellingham and go with a three and match against them. And then the, the two wide players have, have to get close to Kane and the out ball has to be in the fullback areas for us. And we have to move the wingers inside a little bit a la how Liverpool play, basically. So that's kind of difficult to predict till, till we know who we're going to play. I do think it might be France, by the way. Fuck it, bring it on. Bring yeah, it on. We, we, what so. we've got to do in that game next week is when we have the ball in turnovers, we have to move it quickly. And that doesn't mean lumping it up to Kane. It means, can we find people behind the lines? And we have to do it quickly. There can't be a second thought about it. There has to be, it's kind of switched so far the other way from England in tournaments have a major problem retaining possession. It's almost like that's become ingrained in us. And I think even me as a fan, when I went on the FPL Happy Hour pod, I was speaking to Robin Sham and saying, the biggest thing for England is I have to learn to keep the ball. But the problem isn't keeping the ball against the Czech Republics and the Scotland, we know we're going to have more of the ball in those games. It's about can we retain it against better opposition and can we move it quickly between the lines because that's how we're going to break down these teams and we have to be decisive and take a little bit of risk to do that. And that's probably, it's probably going to have to come through Phillips or Rice that plays that incisive pass that opens an opposition up. And I'm a little bit concerned at the moment that that's not happening. And thoughts on Scotland, Croatia. I um, mean, Scotland have played well in the tournament, but not well enough. And out they go. Yeah, I mean, you can reflect on it now and say it was the Czech game that killed them. But what really damaged them here last night, by the looks of it, and I've not obviously watched the whole game, was yeah. the loss of Gilmore that we, we said was going to be absolutely fatal. Because everything that I've read and the bits I've seen... I kind of joked about it already. It did look like it was a little bit of a chase Luka Modric around the football pitch, basically. Yeah. And they afforded him time to dictate and run the game. And then when you've got people like Perisic in dangerous positions, he's good in the air, as proven again last night, can cause some damage. And I just think it was the top-end quality as well. Like Adams, again, I know it was at 3-1, but missed a decent chance last night. McGinn had a chance that was kind of under his feet and he couldn't get it out in the first half. The scoring goals was a problem because um, their XG has been fine, really, for the three games. It's been unfortunate. Look, it's the first tournament for 23 years. They've not discredited themselves. They gave it a good Agreed. go. 
if you'd have offered them the position of getting to the final game and winning, then no, they would definitely go through. I think they would have all taken that. I think the blow of Gilmore destabilised them. It's not just his quality on the ball. It's his quality and how it affects, how it affects yeah. others. It's little things where sometimes as a, as a centre-back, I'll give you a perfect example. Musa Sissoko at Tottenham, right? He's got his back to goal, centre back's got the ball. Do I want to give him the ball? Well, his first touch is going to end up under his feet, and his second touch is probably going to be taking it away and going backwards. You give it to Gilmore as a centre back, and you know that he can play on the half turn, he's comfortable on the ball, even though he's of slight frame, he can hold people off because he's an intelligent player. His little things like that change, and you become hesitant. You think, do I want to put it into that area? I've not got the, yeah, yeah. the same amount of and it, the guys who played last night. I'm I'm sure they did fine. It's just a drop-off quality. Gilmore's going to be phenomenal for Scotland for the next 10 years or so, as long as he stays fit from injuries. And they're going to qualify for the majority of, if it stays under this format, which I'm sure it, they're not going to reduce the teams in it. It's only going to go to 32. They're going to qualify for the majority of European championships over the next couple of decades, I think. They're improving. Um, just missing that top-end bit. And there's a disparity between the very good players in that team, the Robertsons, Gilmores and stuff. And then there's a, a drop off where you've got some players playing for like O'Donnell with Motherwell and stuff like that. And I think he, in the two games I saw, Scott, he did okay at right wing back, but it, there's a drop off. to have Robertson at left wing back and O'Donnell at right wing back. It kind of sums up that Scotland have some very good players, but also have some average players. For Croatia, I think suddenly they become a live threat. In, in the knockout so? stage? Uh, yeah, I think so, a little bit, because they're probably going to play the runners-up of Group E, and if it's not Spain, I'd probably fancy them, actually, because I think in players like Perisic and Modric, they have that that bit of X factor, right? Um, they've also obviously got the experience from three years ago of winning the big games. Do I think they can go on and win the tournament? No. no. But I wouldn't be surprised if they got to the last day, and then you rely a threat depending on the opponent from there. So talk to me about today's games. We've got Spain, Slovakia, Poland, Sweden, right? In the, in the Group E. So what it what it means, what's happened with kind of Ukraine, Finland, what it means is Spain will go through with a draw, even a nil-nil, unless Poland beat Sweden. That's important to say. So if, if there's a point in the game where you think, well, Spain ain't taking risk here and it's kind of nil-nil and say Poland are losing to Sweden, well, that's because if they were to get done once on a counter-attack and go out and finish on two points, then obviously they would go out in third place. But a nil-nil draw is, is enough for them to finish as one of the third place teams as long as Poland don't meet Sweden. Obviously, anyone in that group can, can still go through. Sweden are under four points, will definitely go through. But obviously, they would finish third in the group if Spain win and they themselves lose to Poland. So that group's difficult to predict in terms of what order they'll end up in. I'm sure Spain probably will win tonight, but the nerves might start kicking in a little bit if they don't score early. I think they'll probably win 2-0 or so. I think Sweden and Poland will probably be a draw, right? Yeah, I would have spent a Spain victory and a Swedish-Polish draw is what I would have that would That would obviously knock Poland out and it would leave Spain winning the group, which would then potentially make Spain a quarterfinal opponent for England on that route. So, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't want to look beyond the last 16 game, and we'd be very stupid to do so, really, but there will be a little bit of me thinking tonight, go on, Sweden. Uh, you you couldn't... Got... I, I'm not saying it'd be easy, but you couldn't complain about having them as a quarterfinal opponent again, could you? No, no. And we've got France, Portugal, Germany, Hungary uh, in Group F. France, Portugal, I could see France winning or a draw. I think Germany beating Hungary is I'm fairly confident in. But the other game, I don't see Portugal winning, but I do see a French victory or a draw. So Portugal, because they beat Hungary 3-0 with all those late goals, are in quite a strong position today, whereby they're going to go through unless they lose heavily. So they're on a goal difference of plus one. Uh, Ukraine finished on minus one. Uh, and because of the goals scored as well, they could afford to lose by two. If they lose right. by three, they're potentially in jeopardy. If they lose by two, it depends on goals scored. They've scored five, whereas Ukraine scored, I want to say, four. So they'd be okay if they lost by two. So they'd have to lose by three to go out, unless Hungary beat Germany. 
So if, if Portugal lose to France and Hungary beat Germany, then Portugal will finish bottom of the group. Tournaments, pretty much all this century with France, have been them winning the first two games and drawing the last. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case again tonight. I, I actually Well, they see... didn't win the first two games, did they? They drew against Hungary, so... Very true, but they are through. Um, yeah. But I could, I could see that possibly being nil-nil tonight, actually. Because I, I think both will, both will be relatively happy with that. Yeah, I do agree. But then you've got some of the best attacking talent in the world on the pitch and Ronaldo, Benzema, Mbappe. I, I don't see a nil-nil, to be honest with you, just because of the amount of attacking talent on offer. Portugal defensively, meh. Um, but, but yeah. Uh, it's what it's a dead rubber, right? Well, it's not a dead rubber, but for France it is. So interesting to see what happens in that game. It's not a dead rubber in the sense that uh, part of the issue I think here as well is, as much as we we're, we're looking at that side of the draw, Germany because of their position in the group don't really have the luxury to think. Oh, we're laying for second unless both games are ending level, right? I'm sh- I'm pretty sure that all of them are probably thinking, I take second in this group, you know. And they might all be trying to manipulate that. So I, I think Germany will beat Hungary quite comfortably. I think probably 3-0 or so. And I could yeah. just see France and Portugal, Portugal knowing that if they suddenly concede goals, it's going to put them in problems. And I think France might be looking at it and going, we'll take second here, we'll take England. And then thinking the same thing, that path to the final is quite decent. France won't. Listen, France, Germany, Portugal, none of them three teams are going to fear England on what they've seen so far. We haven't conceded a goal though. No, that's true. Uh, and what would that lead to the last 16? For the for the listeners, oh. tomorrow we're going to run down what the last 16 is, a kind of watch list. And on Friday's pod, we will reveal our drafts uh, as we go into the last 16. Obviously, we're all on wildcard after tonight. Um, well, we're on it now, to be fair, but uh, after tonight. So um, what what do you think and envisage the last 16 looking like as it stands at the moment? Would I you know, think... We know some games, obviously. I think Ukraine might sneak through ahead of Slovakia as a third place team. Um, depending on the score line of that. Slovakia's on score two, conceded two. So if they lose if they lose two nil like I predicted, theirs would be worse than Ukraine and on three points. That's obviously as long as Poland didn't beat Sweden, as said. So I think Ukraine might still sneak through. Um the, <laughs> I'd have to work out how that would work. Croatia would then play. Uh, Sweden if they finish second in the group we could say that and then uh, that goes on to Italy's side of the draw obviously if Germany win the group they'll play a third place team uh, which I've, I'm pretty sure the winner of group F I worked out uh, is highly likely to play Switzerland right. is the most likely Holland are going to play one of the third place teams as well we know Saturday's lineup is Wales v Denmark Italy Austria on Sunday we have Holland versus a third place team and Belgium versus a third place team. One of those two is going to play the third from F, most likely. So we could have Holland versus Portugal or Belgium versus Portugal, which would sound like a very attractive tie. Croatia versus second in Spain's group, which I think will be Sweden on Monday. The winner of F, uh, which I think will be Germany versus Switzerland. And then Tuesday, I think that's going to leave us with England v France and Spain versus a third which I think might be Ukraine, if I work that out correctly, possibly. The, the, Holland or Belgium versus Portugal, England versus France, probably the standout ties of, of the last 16, uh, and could be quite tasty. Very much so. That side of the draw, so the way it works, you'll have England versus whoever they play, will then play the winner of uh, Group E winner and their game. And then the bottom half of that is Wales, Denmark and Holland against whoever they play. Is, and that's that quarter, and then all the others are on the other side. So I mean, that side of the draw, it does open up a little. It bit. does look. I mean, it, it's the, even for Wales's and Denmark's and stuff that everyone on that side is going to be having a little sneaky thinking. There's winnable games here, uh, whereas I think the weaker sides going on the other side of the draw, the Austrias and stuff, very tough to see it opening up that they would progress far. Mm. So there we go. Uh, listeners, do make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to the podcast if you're not already. Tomorrow, 
We'll be running down to watch this because we will know who is playing who. Uh, James has already used his wild card, but I will be on wild cards. So we'll have slightly different strategies where I might be potentially a little bit more riskier. Knowing You'll be on I wild card for the quarterfinals. So you're basically free hitting, basically. So yeah. I'm free hitting in, in, in the last 16. So I can take a few more punts than, than James might be able to. So we'll, we'll look at the different strategies for that as well. Friday, we'll be revealing our teams. Um, and if you are interested in our Patreon, which if you sign up this month before next Wednesday means July will be free. Season five, episode zero tomorrow of FPL. If you're really uh, already into it, uh, that's going to be for our patrons only. So it might be worth thinking about subscribing today. Tomorrow you'll get access to that content as well. Season five, episode zero, because we don't. It's so early. We don't think it warrants being episode one. No, but there'll be a little bit. There'll be a little bit of fun and games in that, and, and as always, we'll enjoy it. So uh, a bit of rundown at FPL tomorrow for Patreons. Anything else to add, James? No, that's it. Group stage done. And then the real nice. tournament starts on Saturday, doesn't it? Good, good. And I can shut down my mobile recording studio, as our friend Stephen Toomey will call it, because I'll be back in the office tomorrow. Have you seen this this Scottish fella? I, I The tweet I sent earlier. I can't stop watching it. I've watched this clip about 100 times. No, I saw I can't stop watching this. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm going to head over to Twitter as soon as we're oh, done. His base is this guy. He's obviously he's in like a fan park or something watching Scotland. And he goes to he goes to you know like you've got bench tables. He goes to kick the the seat of the bench table, and he misses, and he kicks on top of the just ends up looking like a complete prat. Scotland, it was nice having you. Adios, uh, indeed. Stay safe wherever you are, our friends, patrons, listeners, and the lot. We'll be back at you tomorrow. Chat for now. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the football. Be nice to each other. Cue music, please, man, child.